It has now been declassified that Oswald was trained by the CIA in 1957 under the cover of the Office of Naval Intelligence. These political assassinations continue to this day. The 11-person jury in the inquest must decide if these stills, never before seen of Diana and the Mercedes and then the crash, are the frantic moments after a tragic accident or the aftermath of a calculated murder. Mr. Mohammed Al Fayed, Dodi's father, has long since made up his mind. I believe that my son and Prince Diana have been murdered by the royal family. He claims Diana was pregnant and about to announce her engagement to his son, an embarrassment so great, he says, that Prince Philip commissioned British Secret Service to kill the couple. Assassination is an option when the ruling class can identify an enemy who cannot be compromised. But how do they bend the population's will to do their bidding? Well, the false flag operation is one in which the attacker carries the flag of someone else. It's usually a military operation, and the purpose, of course, is to create the uh, uh, impression that the attacker is someone else. They want to create negative public opinion against the nation whose flag was being used. Um, or they may even not use a flag at all. This sort of thing is done all the time, and uh, it's certainly not unique in history. I think we've been seeing a lot of it lately. Americans are easily motivated by false flag operations, and uh, I think it's inevitable that we will see false flag operations in the near future. It is used in order to seize power at an accelerated pace. A very well-documented modern example of this is the Tonkin Gulf incident. There were two sets of uh, Tonkin Gulf incidents. The first one on August 2nd were real but trivial. The second on August 4th, two days later, were the ones to which we actually sent planes off in retaliation and were, in theory, much bigger, a torpedo attack on a U.S. destroyer. But in fact, it never happened. When McNamara visited Vietnam, he confirmed the Tonkin Gulf incident never occurred, and once again, we were lied into war. To this day, I don't know what happened on August 2nd and August 4th, 1964, in the Tonkin Gulf. The general provided the answer, saying his Navy attacked the Maddox on August 2nd, but on the 4th, nothing happened. There was absolutely nothing, he said. We know for a fact now that NSA and CIA both falsified their reports up to Johnson on that day to make it look as if there had been an attack. Upon the fall of communism, a new threat had to be established in order to maintain their military industrial complex and keep the people in fear of invisible enemies. More modern examples of this have been used not only to start conflicts abroad, but to instill fear in large populations in order to demonize groups and further erode civil liberties. The majority of people still believe that Timothy McVeigh was a right-wing extremist who bombed the Oklahoma City building with a rider truck because he was upset with the government. People close to the event told a very different story. A local congressman believes that convicted bomber Timothy McVeigh and his accused co-conspirator Terry Nichols are not the only ones involved. The Oklahoma State Representative Charles Key produced a videotape featuring witnesses who claim to have seen Timothy McVeigh with another man the morning of the bombing. He was wearing a ball cap. Timothy McVeigh had his on backwards, which just like this. It was on his head. The other gentleman had his on like this. In fact, the FBI had actively pursued John Doe No. 2 in its initial investigation, then denied his existence altogether. There were also multiple reports that explosives were found inside the Murrah building. The Justice Department is reporting that a second explosive device has been found in the AP Murrah uh, building in downtown Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, you're still with us, aren't you? Yes, I am, and I, and I might tell you in addition to that that in fact, what we were told at the scene a few minutes ago was that, in fact, two different explosive devices were found in addition to the one that went off. The second explosive was found and diffused. The third explosive that was found, and they are working on right now as we speak, I understand, both the second and third explosives, if you can imagine this, were larger than the first. Bomb squads were actually caught on video pulling into the building to retrieve these devices. They'll back that trailer down there, and the uh, bomb squad folks will go in 
and they will use that uh, that trailer. You see the the bucket on the back there. Sort of this is how they would transport the explosive device away from this populated area to try to do something with. It. I just took a look down the street uh, at the Mara building again. I see another bomb truck going. So apparently they're going to try to get out that third bomb that's been talked about. This was even confirmed by the governor at the time, Frank Keating. One device was. Uh, was uh, deactivated. Apparently there's another device, and obviously whatever did the damage to the Murrah building was a tremendous, uh, very sophisticated explosive device. Members of the ATF who would have normally been in the building were tipped off prior to the bombing. He saw what appeared to be a police bomb squad truck near the Murrah building two hours before the blast. It had a shield on the side of the door, and it said bomb disposal or bomb squad, blow it, and I really found that interesting. Another witness who spoke to ABC News on the condition of anonymity will tell the grand jury tomorrow he was told by an ATF official agents working in the building had been warned in advance not to come to work. He just came out and told me that the ATF wasn't in the building that day. They'd been tipped by their pagers not to come to work, uh, which I was, flabber I was flabbergasted. McVeigh would even claim in a letter written to his sister which was published by the New York Times, that he was actually recruited for black operations, which included smuggling drugs into the United States, as well as assassinations. One may brush this off as the ravings of a madman. However, McVeigh was filmed at the Camp Grafton Military Facility in North Dakota on August 3, 1993. McVeigh's official records state that he was discharged over a year prior from the Army Reserve in May of 1992. Perhaps even more interesting, is that Camp Grafton was specializing in training troops in explosives and demolitions at the time. When all was said and done, the security tapes reported to have captured the entire thing on video were rounded up and classified. In 2009, they were finally released, and magically none of them caught the bombing. The excuse being they were all having their tapes changed at that exact moment. This event would be labeled domestic extremism, which was used to demonize critics of world government, militias, and create fear within the populace. Muslim extremism seemed to show its ugly face in then unprecedented fashion on February 26, 1993. A truck bomb had gone off in the parking area of the World Trade Center. Luckily, the bombers failed to follow instructions and parked the truck carrying the explosives against the main support column. What is not discussed, however, is the bomb was actually built by an FBI informant under the supervision of the FBI. Ahmed Salam, a former Egyptian army officer who had been doing undercover work for the FBI, was the man who actually built the bomb. When he was told that he would have to use real bomb-making material instead of harmless substitutes, he became suspicious and began taping his conversations with FBI officials. Last winter, the FBI was praised for its speed in cracking the case of the World Trade Center bombing and bringing four suspects to trial. Now, there is some evidence that the FBI may have known of the plot in advance through an informant and might, might even have stopped the bombing that killed six people. Notice the media emphasizes that they might have been able to stop it. They then gloss over the fact that the bomb was built by their agent under FBI supervision in conjunction with the district attorney. FBI agents might have been able to prevent last February's deadly explosion at New York's World Trade Center. They discussed secretly substituting harmless powder for the explosives, but they didn't, according to the FBI's own informant, Imad Salem. Unbeknownst to the FBI at the time, Salem recorded many of his conversations with his handlers. The actual recording where Salam discusses this with his FBI handler, John Antisev, was released years after the trial. You got paid regularly for, for good information. I mean, the expenses were a little bit out of the ordinary, and it was really questioned. Don't tell Nancy I told you this. Well, well, I have to tell her, of course. Well, then if you have to, you have to. Yeah, because, I mean, the lady was being honest, and I was being honest, and everything was submitted with a receipt. Yeah. I'm... And now it's questionable. It's not questionable. It's like a, a little out of ordinary. Okay. You know, the... all right. I don't think it was. If that's what you think, guys, fine. But I don't think that because we was start already building the bomb, which is went off in the World Trade Center. It was built by uh, uh, supervising uh, supervision from the bureau and the GA, and we was all informed about it. And we know that the bomb start to be built by who? By your confidential informant. What a wonderful, great case. Following the convictions of the Muslims who were too inept to make their own bomb and park the vehicle in the proper area, Salam was pulled into the FBI's witness protection program 
where he has never been heard from.